Thanks for coming. Uh, you got a good turnout, out, standing room only. Uh, I've known Jose for many years, and most notably starting from the beginning, which is about seven years ago, we started organizing Singularity University. Uh, that was started seven years ago. Larry Page and Megan Smith worked with Peter Diamandis and myself and Jose to start this university. It's about a mile from here. And uh, it teaches uh, the, many of the things that Jose will uh, be talking about today. Uh, he has been on the faculty and has helped develop the concept and the organization, uh, heads up our relationship with Latin America. And for that matter, I think your sister-in-law heads up uh, Google Latin America, at least the Spanish part of it. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Jose has a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from MIT, PhD from Universidad Simon Bolivar. He's been a strategy consultant with Booz Allen, an advisor to many uh, leading corporations in Latin America. He's been an invited professor at MIT and other leading universities. He's written more than 10 books, which I think is more than I've written. So that, um, he has an opinion column that appears regularly in BBC, CNN, New York Times, and other media outlets. He has filmed documentaries with the Discovery Channel and the History Channel. Uh, Jose is going to share his ideas on our exponential future. His uh, talk is titled, The Future of Technology and the Technology of the Future. So welcome to Jose. Um, good afternoon, and it is a pleasure for me to be here uh, to talk about the future. I love the future because we're going to live the rest of our lives in the future. So uh, I am in many different uh, organizations around the planet, uh, traveling constantly. Um, one of the things that I do the most is working with the Millennium Project that began as the futuristic part of the United Nations University. But now it's an independent NGO, and every year we compile information about the global grand challenges of the planet, and we publish it in a yearly book, which uh, this is the latest edition, 2013-2014, A State of the Future. This is a copy for you here in Google. I hope you enjoyed. This has an incredible wealth of information about the future. And um, also, we just published a book about the future of Latin America that has been recommended by four presidents in Latin America, from the president of Mexico, Enrique Peña Nieto, to the former president of Brazil, eh, eh, Fer eh, Fernando Enrique Cardoso, and other people. And we talk about four different scenarios for Latin America. One of those scenarios is the singularity in Latin America. So if you're interested in that, I also have a copy for you here in Google in uh, electronic format, uh, if you still use uh, CDs, uh, <laughs> so that you can read the book and the four scenarios. Number one, uh, mañana is hoy. It's about the singularity in Latin America. Uh, I presented this at the World Economic Forum, uh, Davos, for Latin America. And then I was on a TV program in CNN with Donald Trump. So I'm very honored to be talking about the future of Latin America and the singularity in Latin America uh, in the next 20 to 30 years. But the reason why I'm also here is to talk a little more about exponential technologies. And I have been involved with Singularity University since the first class. And um, I just want to give you a, a quick overview of the fantastic things we believe are going to be happening in the next few years. Uh, many of you probably already saw a couple of years ago when uh, Ray Kurzweil is featured in uh, Time magazine. The whole article is about Ray. <laughs> and about the year 2045 uh, uh, and about the technological singularity. And if you look, the beautiful subtitle is the year man becomes immortal. But for the ladies, you will be immortal too. <laughs> okay, don't worry. Both men and women will become immortal. But actually, uh, Singularity University it's not a university, and it is not about the singularity. So the name is kind of uh, interesting because uh, it really is about exponential technologies to improve the conditions of the world. I am myself from the developing world. I grew up in Latin America, so I have experienced what poverty is and uh, how things can change quickly. So we are very happy that among the founders, effectively, is um, Larry Page. Um, but anyway. 
we have many other companies supporting Singularity University. The summer program basically is structured in three parts. The first part, the, the participants, we, call, we don't call them students, the participants learn about the technologies. In the second part, we have a convergence and site visits. And then this, the participants begin working on team projects about how to use these new technologies, exponential technologies, to improve the human condition, how to improve health, uh, energy, uh, security, water, environment, all the problems of humanity in the next few years. In fact, the goal is that the students or participants have to finish with a project to impact the world positively in 10 years, at least for 1 billion people. So it is a big challenge. 1 billion people in 10 years. Um, some of the startups that have originated out of Singularity University are incredible companies like Actually, I just want to name Made in Space because tomorrow history will be written. And not just on Earth, in space. Made in Space is taking 3D printers tomorrow to the International Space Station. This is the first time humans will print something outside our tiny planet. This is the beginning of colonization of the world, the universe, and beyond. And it, it is done by Singularity University students, so we are really, really proud. But we have many other incredible companies. Matternet, Matternet right now is working in Bhutan. In Bhutan, using drones to transport food and medicines in a country that has almost no roads or no infrastructure. Or other uh, companies like Modern Meadow that is working on a cultured meat. Some people like to call it in vitro meat, but we prefer cultured meat. Um, so what is the singularity? Because I haven't told you yet what is the singularity. Well, the father of the singularity is right here, uh, Ray Kurzweil, and his famous book, uh, The Singularity is Near, is recommended by Bill Gates as the best book in the world. Actually, I don't think that that is right, because the best book in the world is <laughs> The State of the Future that we published with the Millennium Project. But Bill Gates hasn't read this yet. Uh, nonetheless, why is the singularity is near so important? Because Ray wrote about 10 years ago about these incredible changes. And forget about Moore's law. Moore's law is only one little part of what Ray calls the law of accelerating returns which was beyond, before, and after Moore's law. OK, so we are living in incredible times. If this trend continues, uh, in the next 20 to 30 years, we will have computers that have many more transistors than our brains have neurons. And I will talk a little bit about that later. Uh, you probably remember these techn old technologies. For some of you who are old enough, uh, Ray. <laughs> Uh, the punch cards, the IBM punch cards, these were used 40 years ago. Okay, this was 1K of memory, 1K. This is 10 times 100, 1,000, 1K. But these memories, once you wrote on them, you couldn't erase, okay? So electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic memories were invented. This is 8 inches, and it is also 1K. But this 1K is better than this 1K because this you could erase, you could change. In Spanish, we say 1K and 1K. How much is 1K plus 1K? It's 1K. 1K. <laughs> 40 years ago, we had 1K of memory. And then, obviously, we moved to this. Some of you might remember this. Uh, 512 kakas. Then we moved to this, 1.4 megas. And uh, I just came back from Asia, and I bought this beautiful thing. This has. 128 gigabytes, $20. 128 gigabytes, $20 in China. So imagine what has happened in 40 years. We went from caca to 128 gigabytes. What do you think is going to happen in the next 30 years? You are going to remember me in 30 years, and you will remember caca, but this will be caca. We are going to have devices that have uh, more transistors than we have neurons in our brains in the next few years. But anyway, I just wanted to remind you of the history that we have gone through. This is happening in all technologies, including biotechnology. At Singularity University, the participants in the summer programs get their genome sequenced. Uh, there are many devices like this. Uh, this is a gene chip to sequence the genome. And it allows you to know uh, what you are made of, what diseases you will have, 
for example, what is the probability that I will have psoriasis, diabetes, prostate cancer, and many other things I don't want to show, Alzheimer's, Parkinson, and so on. What are my personal traits, the color of my eyes? All of this is written in our genes. So soon, I guess many of you have already done this because this has existed for about uh, almost 10 years, some of these technologies. But soon all of us will have this and we'll understand this because we don't yet understand the genome. And soon you will know what is the color of your eyes if you didn't know it. And what you will die of so that you do not die of it. Okay, because the beautiful is that medicine will change. Medicine now is a bad art and soon it will be a good science. Another thing you will discover, if you have done the 23andMe or another similar uh, uh, mechanism like this, uh, is for example, uh, where do you come from? Where did your ancestors come from? And this is my parents, my father, 500 years ago. You can see he comes from Spain all the way to Asia, to Mongolia. And you will see famous people related to my father like Genghis Khan. Now, I will show you my maternal line, also 500 years ago. And so she comes also from Spain all the way to Siberia. And famous people related to my mother, Marie Antoinette. So I come from a very aristocratic family <laughs> between Gengis Khan and Marie Antoinette. Uh, with this, you will be able to uh, construct your genealogical tree. And you will know for the first time if your father is really your father. But more interesting than looking backwards is looking forward. And in the future, we will design our children. This is an experiment that I did with one of my students sharing genes. This is a theoretical experiment, okay, to find out how our children could be. What is the probability for different conditions, different traits, different diseases, and then pick those that you want or that you do not want. Uh, obviously, this was incredibly expensive at the beginning. The first uh, genome began to be sequenced in 1990. The Human Genome Project began in 1990 and it finished in 2003. It took 13 years and it cost the US government $1 billion plus two other billion dollars from other governments, Europe, Japan, and so on. $3 billion, 13 years, one genome. Today, you can sequence the full a genome for slightly over $1,000 today. And if you do the partial sequence, like 23andMe, it is $99. Um, we expect that by 2025, at the latest, it will cost $10. And it will take only one minute to do. If you remember this, remember CACA? Well, what is happening in biotechnology is more incredible. From $1 billion to $10, from 13 years to one minute. This is incredible, and this is happening in all technologies. Also, even in economics, if we look at how development is changing, countries are growing faster and faster. The first nation that doubled its income per capita was the United Kingdom during the Industrial Revolution, and it took the UK between 1780 and 1838. That is 58 years to be the first nation in human history that doubled its income per capita. Today, China is doing that every seven years. This is absolutely incredible. If you look at this throughout the centuries, the last millennia, humanity didn't really grow until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution late in the 18th century. By the 19th century, the GDP per capita cumulative of the planet grew 100% in the century. Last century, in the 20th century, grew almost 400%. If this rate continues, and I believe it will, we'll probably grow 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 percent this century. We have seen nothing yet of what is going to happen. Additionally, the population is finally becoming more stable if we look uh, long term from the 18th century. And look that this is a linear scale. Now I want to show you the same change for GDP per capita because the GDP, the income, is growing exponentially. From the 18th century, when uh, humanity had a um, relatively low income, all of humanity was around $1,000 per capita per year, that was until the Industrial Revolution, it began growing. And then it reached 10,000. Soon it will reach $100,000. And look, that uh, there is the catching up effect of the poorer countries growing faster. So we are truly living incredible times.
So things are changing exponentially, faster, becoming smaller, cheaper, and better. Uh, this is an example that um, Peter Diamandis, the co-founder of Singularity University, likes to talk about, and, and Ray, about uh, comparing linear and exponential steps. If you give 30 linear steps, you advance 30 meters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, if you take exponential steps after 30 steps, you go around the planet 26 times. And this is something that we cannot comprehend. Our brains cannot understand easily exponential change. But technology is changing exponentially. So to talk about the future, we have a very famous philosopher in Latin America, Mafalda. Mafalda is very well known as the most popular cartoon. And then she was asked once, what is the future? And she said, well, the future is no longer what it used to be. <laughs> so we need to add value to everything. In Latin America, for example, some countries uh, produce coffee. Does anyone know who this is? Juan Valdez. Juan Valdez, exactly, <laughs> Juan Valdez. Uh, Colombia, this is the symbol of Colombian coffee. Colombia usually sells in the best years $2 billion of coffee. Does anyone know how much a Starbucks sells? Over $10 billion. So we have to add value in Latin America and everywhere. I'll give you another example because I am a big, big fan of Mickey Mouse. If you don't believe me, I'll show you. I truly like Mickey Mouse. And I'll tell you why. We have to move from manufacturing to manufacturing. This little Mickey Mouse hat is made of petroleum, Venezuelan petroleum, the country where I grew up. Now, if you go to Disney World and you buy a Mickey Mouse hat, how many dollars do you think that this hat is worth? How many dollars? 20? Actually, it's, it's about $10, but I'll sell it to you for 20. Um, and it is totally made of oil, OK? Now, do you know how much is a barrel of oil today about? $100. And how many Mickey Mouse hats do you think you can make from a barrel of oil? A 1,000, probably, or more. So a 1,000 Mickey Mouse hats times $10 per hat makes $10,000 in hats. And the barrel of oil is $100. So where is the value? The value is not in the raw materials not even in the manufacturing, it's in the mind factoring, in the mind factoring. So this is a very important concept, I believe, mind factoring. So we futurists, we talk about four ways to look into the future. The worst one is to be passive, like an ostrich that hides its head, doesn't want to know what is going to happen. The second way is to be reactive, okay, like a firefighter when there is a problem. The third way is to be preactive. OK, when you buy insurance, for example, to be prepared for something. But the best way is to be proactive, to create the future that you want, to build the future that you want. So I hope that you are proactive here and that there are no ostriches here. But if there are ostriches, at least they should be technological ostriches. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, a few years ago, six, seven years ago, I went to visit Sir Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, before he died in Sri Lanka. And uh, he's very famous uh, among um, futurists. Um, Sir Arthur C. Clarke, he's very famous not just because of a Space Odyssey 2001. He's very famous because of the three laws of the future. Um, I'll read them to you. The first law, when a distinguished uh, famous scientist says that something is possible, he's probably right. But when he says it is impossible, he's probably wrong. Second law of the future, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture past the limits into the impossible. And the third law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So now I am going to talk about magic because the technologies of the future have to be magical. And if they don't look like magic, it's because they are not advanced. 30 years ago, um, we just began using personal computers. Actually, I remember when I did my master's thesis at MIT, I actually used a prehistoric technology called typewriter uh, for my first thesis at MIT. Imagine a typewriter, that prehistoric te technology. 20 years ago, uh, mobile telephones were becoming popular. 10 years ago, Google was uh, still growing up, a smaller startup. 
So what is going to happen in the next 10, 20, 30 years? We are going to have incredible technologies. One of them is the control of aging. Actually, we have um, some of the faculty at Singularity University that say that aging is a disease, but a curable disease. And we will cure this disease within the next 20 to 30 years. In fact, I believe we are going to see physical immortality soon, what I call the death of death. Actually, to, make, to put this into re reference, we already have cells which are immortal, which are the germinal cells. Germinal cells do not age. That doesn't mean that they are truly mortal, because if someone kills them, they die, but they do not age. The same as bacteria. Bacteria do not age. Again, they are not immortal. You might kill the bacteria, but they do not age, which is the important concept. And then we have another type of cells, which are pretty bad, which are the cancer cells, that also discover how to become immortal, or at least how not to age. So we know this is possible because we have good cells that do not age and bad cells that do not age. Now there are many companies and groups working on this. The M Prize, uh, the Methuselah Foundation has a prize for the last 10 years to try to extend the longevity of mice. And it's very important and very easy to do experiments with mice because they only live one year and a half. You cannot do experiments with humans because we die in the middle of the road. But with a little mouse that only lasts for a year and a half, we can extend their lives and see the results. As of now, we have some mice that live three times their expected lifetime. That is mice that live four and a half and five years. We have uh, Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit flies, that live four times their regular life spans. We have some worms that actually live six times their normal um, life span. And this is increasing. This has been done in the last 10 years. So imagine what we are going to do in the next 10 years. In fact, while well, the, the sense a research foundation by Aubrey de Grey is working extensively in all of this, and so is a Russian um, billionaire, Dmitry Iskov. He's working on the 2045 Avatar project about virtual immortality, but many other companies, including Google. You, I imagine you all saw this, and um, uh, Calico announced last week, California Life Company, from Google announced that they are going to make an investment of one and a half billion dollars. That's a lot of money. Okay, so, and I trust Google, so I know they are doing something interesting and something right. But not just Google, other companies, one of the co founders of Singularity University, Peter Diamandis, is working with Craig Venter and other people in Human Longevity Inc. In fact, they stole some people from Google to work uh, in this company uh, that is also working towards uh, indefinite lifespans. And just four days ago, a new prize was announced, the Palo Alto Longevity Prize for Immortality. Okay, this is really just beginning. All of this that I showed you happened in one year, all these companies. I have actually done two TV programs, one for a, in Latin America in Spanish, one for History Channel and one for Discovery Channel about all these technologies and what we are going to see. But now let me tell you about the four technologies of the future. This was a study done by the National Science Foundation 10 years ago with the Department of Commerce. They decided that the four main technologies that will change humanity and that will change humans, humans also, are nano, bio, info, and cogno. Let me show you quickly these technologies. This is a very interesting way to, to put the nano studies atoms, bio studies cells, info studies bits and bytes, cogno neurons. If we look into this further, the top two, nano and bio, are the hardware of life. And if we look below, info and cogno are the software of life. And now I will tell you what is the complexity of the human hardware and of the human software. So which complexity level we have to reach in order to have immortality of the hardware and immortality of the software. Nanotechnology, again, studying atoms, molecules, and every time go smaller, 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 beginning actually even with 3D printers. I love 3D printers. Uh, and also, again, because Tomorrow, history will be written when Made in Space begins printing in the International Space Station. Anyway, this is a big printer. Now, uh, printers can 
uh, do a smaller and a smaller and a smaller things. But again, we can also go from the bottom up. We can go atom by atom by atom. Eventually, for example, this is a, a, an engine made of different atoms. Uh, different colors are different elements, oxygen, sodium, calcium, and so on and so forth. And this is a design of the smallest possible rotating engine in this shape. So with nanotechnology, we will have actually an incredible world where there will be no waste, no waste. In fact, waste is a word that we have to eliminate from language. There is no waste. There is only raw material in the wrong place. Raw material in the wrong place. And with nanotechnology, we will reprocess uh, all materials. And we will have incredible clean cities, which are very advanced. Second technology, biotechnology which I like to describe as living nanotechnology. Nanotechnology, but alive. Many experiments have been done in the last few years. Ten years ago, a Taiwanese company began creating these glow fish, which are transgenic fish, the zebra fish with uh, the fluorescent gene of the medusa from the Caribbean. And you can have these uh, zebra fish in five different colors. Really beautiful. Actually. Uh, Last uh, year or two years ago, one of our students at Singularity University created this uh, company, Glowing Plants, okay? Which is a plant that has also the gene of bioluminescence from the firefly. He was looking for $65,000, and at the end of the process, he finished with, uh, he had 300,000, 400,000, he almost got half a million dollars for these glowing plants. OK, obviously, he advertised they might be marijuana plants, and, and some people like glowing marijuana. But actually, <laughs> actually, these are tobacco plants. But some people like tobacco, too. Anyway, uh, this is incredible. One of the students of Singularity University working on that. Also, one of our faculty at Singularity University, um, Stuart Brand, he's working on the extinction to bring back species that have died, that have disappeared. One of the easiest cases actually are the, the mammoth. There are many frozen mammoths in Siberia. So many that the Russian government is working with several scientists from the USA, from Japan, and Korea to bring them back to life. And they are even created a Pleistocene park, not Jurassic Park, but Pleistocene Park in northern Siberia. So probably we will have mammoths back to life in the next few years in Russia. And cloning, cloning is, is an important technology, but not for reproduction. For reproduction is better the typical system. Cloning will be used not for reproduction, but for therapeutic reasons, to create organs, to fix organs. And this is a very interesting technology that uh, in Singapore, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the father of Singapore, created a city called Biopolis. Uh, where they are doing all kinds of experiments on uh, biotechnology and cloning. But many other countries are doing that, like Russia. And the problem with Russia is you never know what the Russians are thinking. <laughs> so you have to be careful about the Russians and cloning in Russia. <laughs> but another incredible country working on this is India. And I love India. I have been many times to India. And if you know the Indian gods, they are very strange. They have gods that have three heads. Gods that have eight arms. However, think how useful it could be to have three heads. One head is working, one head is having fun, and the third head is sleeping all at the same time. Okay, uh, or having eight arms. Wouldn't this be wonderful? I know that you laugh, but if you are come from India, this is normal because your gods have three heads and eight arms. So. I want you to come out of your Western model for some of you and to think about other religions. Because also in India, they believe in rebirth. They believe in reincarnation. And what is the closest thing in biology to reincarnation? Cloning. OK, so India is advancing very fast on cloning technologies. And now let me tell you the first of the two numbers that I want you to memorize, which is the complexity of the human hardware. And later, I will tell you the complexity of the human software. OK, um, scientists 10 years ago created an artificial virus. But a virus is very small, has very few genes, and a small number of base pairs of nucleotides. If you remember biology, A goes with T, and C goes with G. 
Okay, so basically, an artificial virus was created 10 years ago. Two years ago, another scientist, actually Craig Venter, created uh, an artificial bacteria. Uh, but bacteria are obviously bigger. And in order to prove that he created the bacteria, they even, the scientists even put the email of the team that created the bacteria. And um, so, but it's still, a bacteria is small. However, how long will it take until we can create something like a human being? And that is number one, three gigabytes. That is the complexity of the human hardware, three gigabytes. Even the most complex people here has no more than three gigabytes. Even Ray has only three gigabytes. <laughs> here, I have a pen drive. This massive redundancy in there. On yeah. top, thank you. Absolutely. The actual amount of data, if you just compress out the redundancy, is about 50 million bytes. So you see how small we are? And, and this pen drive has 128 gigabytes. So how many people can I fit here? <laughs> Divide 128 gigabytes by 3 gigabytes and add the, the redundancy factor that Ray mentioned. And here you can fit 42 people and a little cat. <laughs> Okay, now I will move into the complexity of the uh, processing software. For that, we go into the, well, again, uh, remember, we humans, we are basically four letters, A, T, C, G. Third technology, infotechnology. Um, according to the advances in uh, computers and the processing power, we are basically reaching the complexity of a spider, a lizard, and then in 20, 30 years, we will reach the complexity of a monkey, of a human. And everything will be connected, just like in telecommunications, becoming smaller and more powerful. And soon we will get into the fifth generation of telecommunications. So much that I was traveling in Scandinavia a few months ago, and I saw this advertisement about telecommunications where they say that the children will actually be born already with internet connected. <laughs> and the first thing they will ask is for more bandwidth. They need more bandwidth. Because we are going to connect everybody with everybody. We will probably create a global brain, a global network into what is called the Internet of Things. Everything will be connected with everything. The Internet of Things. and. Um, people, computers, cars, especially if they drive themselves, the self-driving cars. Also, BMW announced that by 2025, all of their cars will be fully automatic, fully self-driving cars. They don't want humans. We are very bad driving, uh, so they don't want humans driving cars. And we will connect ourselves uh, uh, with the internet in different ways. Google Glass is one of those new ways, internet to our eyes and our eyes to internet, for example. But what I find truly fascinating was the announcement ba made uh, in uh, April, uh, April last year by Eric Schmidt about connecting the whole planet with free internet. This is beautiful. This will change the world. It will change the world. But then obviously other companies didn't stay behind. And Mark Zuckerberg announced a few months later that uh, Facebook had a different program, but also with the objective by 2020 to connect the whole planet in the middle of the Sahara, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, in the North Pole. But later, still another group called OuterNet, as opposed to Internet, OuterNet, because they are working with microsatellites. I don't know if they're microsatellites, or if the drones, or if the balloons will win. What I do know is that before 2020, we will have free internet in the whole planet, in the whole planet. This is the most incredible, I think, to democratize knowledge, to democratize access to information. And artificial intelligence keeps on uh, progressing. Uh, you are all familiar with IBM's Watson, that in 2011 bid the two experts in the game, Ken and Brad. Actually, Ken was normally so good at playing Jeopardy that he even wrote a book about how to win at the game Jeopardy. And do you know what Watson did? Watson read the book. <laughs> but Watson not only read that book, Watson was born with Wikipedia in its head. How many of you have Wikipedia in your brains? Or even 1% of it? And 
And do you even remember 1% of what you have read? Well, Watson remembers it all. Now, obviously, it was very expensive. It was over $40 million to develop Watson. Uh, many scientists working f during uh, four years or a bit longer. But soon, it will probably, probably be free. It will be fee a free application, like it happened before with the blue, uh, when in uh, 1997, beat uh, the world chess champion, Garry Kasparov. That computer actually was m much more expensive. That computer was over $100 million. And it took IBM over 10 years. Obviously, we had bad technology 20 years ago compared to what we have today. Do you know how much is that today? You can buy the descendant of Deep Blue for free. You can get descendants of Deep Blue free in internet. And no human can beat those programs. So anyway, one of the first applications, as you probably know, of IBM is uh, Dr. Watson, in order to become a good medical doctor. He will know all the books of medicine, all the journals of medical, uh, medicine, all the personal histories of the patients who allow that. No human can have access or process all that information. So finally, medicine will be good. Instead of bad, as it is now, it will be a good science. And so we arrive at the last and final technology, which is the most interesting. Cognitive technology, neuroscience, the brain. The brain is very important because it is the most complex organ in the human body. And it is basically the only organ that we have not been able to reproduce artificially yet. We have been able to do almost anything, artificial eyes, artificial pancreas, artificial uh, lungs, artificial hearts, everything, except for the brain. Why? Because the brain is the most complex organ. Not only that, it is the most complex structure in the known universe. Maybe tomorrow, we have a Martian who has a bigger brain than we humans. But until that time, there is nothing that we know of more complex than the human brain. And you know what? The brain is not that complex. And in the next few years, we are going to decipher the brain, which is the final frontier in terms of complexity. But we will go beyond the brain. For that, you have to read Ray's book, How to Create a Mind. <laughs> he explains a lot about that. And now the book is, is in Spanish, it is in German, and in many other languages. And it is recommended by uh, my colleague uh, from Venezuela, who is the president of MIT, Rafael Reif, as one of the best books uh, there is to understand how the mind, the brain work. And how did the brain evolve? We, we understand today that the brain has been changing through ages. In fact, in Japan, they have uh, the Riken Brain Institute, where they have followed the evolution, biological evolution of the brain and how the brain can continue evolving, can continue changing. So also, in terms of the genome, let me tell you, once all of you sequence your genome, you will realize that we are 99% equal to a monkey. We are very close to a monkey. Uh, and we are about 90% equal to a mouse. So actually, we are very similar. So if we are only 1% above, to put it that way, above a monkey, or 10% above a mouse. Can you imagine 1% above a human? Or 10% above a human? Or 100% above a human? So all these things we are going to see. Anyway, in Japan, they are working on this uh, Brain Research Institute. And they originally had a plan for the year 2018 to create artificial brains. Since that time, actually, they began in 1997. Now they, they say they are running between 5 and 10 years late. But still, they are moving forward. They say between 2023 and 2028, they will be able to recreate artificial brains, equivalent to human brains. Uh, in the USA, as you know, uh, a few years ago, uh, the Human Connectome Project began. And last year, President Barack Obama announced the Brain Initiative with $1 billion for the next 10 years. And just at around the same time, the European Union gave 1 billion euros for the Human Brain Project. So I don't know if the USA, if Europe or Japan is going to do it, and China is coming up soon with their own program, 
But in the next 10 years, we will understand how the brain works and we will be able to replicate artificial brains. So this is the second number I would like for you to, to remember. And it's a very simple schematic, but uh, a brain basically has a hundred billion neurons. That is 10 to the 11 neurons. That is all the neurons we have in the brain. We can have less, but we don't have more. So let's take 10 to the 11. Each neuron has about a thousand connections, 2,000 connections, 4,000 connections, maybe a bit more, a bit less. That gives about 10 to the 14 connections or synapses. And these synapses are the ones that compute. The brain has basically six main frequencies alpha waves, beta waves, delta waves, mu waves, which are actually very, very slow. The brain frequencies are 1 hertz, 10 hertz, 100 hertz. A very fast brain, like Ray's brain, is 1 kilohertz. 1 kilohertz. My telephone has a chip of 3 gigahertz. So this telephone computes a million times faster than any human brain. The difference, obviously, is that I still have more neurons than this has transistors. But this will change in the next 10 to 20 years. And we will have devices that process a million times faster than our brains and that have as many transistors, equivalent neurons as we do. So the complexity of the human software, to put it that way, is 10 to the 17. And this is a ballpark figure. Some people say it is 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16. Some people say it is 10 to the 18, 10 to the 20. I do not care. It is just a matter of time. Due to the law of accelerating returns, it can be five years earlier or five years later. But it is a finite number that we know. It's a fina finite number. So if we don't talk about the mind, the spirit, and the soul, then a brain just computes 10 to the 17 operations per second. And we are going to reach that level in the next 20 years. But there are smaller brains too. No bigger brains yet, <laughs> but we can have smaller brains. And we are going to connect the brains uh, to computers and to other devices with internal brain implants or with external brain implants. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, scientists are beginning to do also brain-to-brain -brain interfaces. And they have been able to transfer from the brain of a mouse to the brain of another mouse how to find cheese in a labyrinth. This is just beginning. They are doing similar experiments with monkeys. And then we are going to do this also with humans. I have this technology, which is already like uh, three, four years ago, but I, I like it a lot because it lets you do a few experiments in terms of concentration, meditation, targeting, uh, and playing other games. This basically is an electroencephalogram. There is no magic here. This is an electroencephalogram that reads what is happening in the central part of my frontal lobe, and then through a Bluetooth connection, sends it to my computer and analyzes what is happening in my brain, okay? Soon we will be able to do this also from person to person. And with more electrodes, we will be able to capture more information. There are companies like Emotive that have 14 electrodes. Soon we will have 100 electrodes. Then we will have 1,000 electrodes. And then we will stop using this primitive technology called talking. Talking is a very primitive technology with a very narrow bandwidth. I have to say word after word after word, and you have to listen to me word after word after word, bad joke, another word, and so on and so forth. <laughs> In the future, we will be able to send the information from brain to brain, like computers do. Everything I wanted to say here is in my brain, but I cannot transfer it fast enough because it is a narrow bandwidth communication system. Obviously, this was incredible because monkeys do not talk. So between a non-talking monkey and us, there is a huge difference. But imagine when we have brain-to-brain -brain communication. It, it is not a dream. Telepathy we will have thanks to technology. And we will uh, uh, do this also with robots. And I want to show you the last 15 years of ASIMO. Look what Honda has done in the last 15 years. I ask you, can you imagine what Honda will do in the next 15 years? 
They say that in 20 years, they will win the World Cup. It will be a robot team winning the World Cup. And robots will be fantastic with many degrees of motion that we don't have humans. And they will have feelings. At MIT, in the MIT Media Lab, they are working on understanding the feelings of robots. And in South Korea, they are working on a law to give human rights to robots. You heard it well, human rights to robots. Because they believe that in 10 to 15 years, every human will have a robot. And those robots will not be stupid. And robots will be absolutely fantastic. Imagine those robots. And also for the women, don't desperate, you will have your fantastic macho robots with the additional advantage that they will not get tired at night. <laughs> Unfortunately, we think normally that robots are bad. And that's because of the former governor of California, <laughs> <laughs> who actually gave one of the opening speeches at the inauguration of Singularity University in 2009. And he said, fantastic that you think about the future because the science fiction of today is the science reality of tomorrow. But here, because of Hollywood, we think robots are bad. Even female robots are bad, too. Including when they have sex, they, they are bad. You know? But are robots good or are robots bad? And I would tell you, it depends where you are from. It depends on your culture. If you grow up in Japan, robots are good. In fact, robots are better than human. When a human has a problem, they expect that a robot will help them. And there are many books now in Japan, for example, How to Have Sex with Robots. And I'm not joking. The mentality of the Japanese and the Korean and the Chinese is totally different. I will give you an example that you will understand with dragons. Dragons in China are good. Dragons in Korea and Japan are good. But dragons in Europe are bad. European dragons are bad. They kill people. They destroy cities. They throw fire. But in Asia, they are good. The same with robots. Robots in Asia are good. And that is why Japan and Korea are the leaders in humanoid robotics in the world today. Because they are good. And all companies in Japan are doing robots. Uh, Honda, Toyota, Fuji, all of them. But again, this is not human or robots. This is human and machines. This is the synergy, the fusion of humans and our creations. We already saw that in the London Olympics uh, with Blade Runner. We saw this also at the opening of the World Cup where a paraplegic person connected to an exoskeleton with a device like this, much more sophisticated, okay, stood up and gave the, init the initial kickoff of the World Cup in Brazil. We are going to see more in two years. After the Olympic Games in Brazil, there will be the first cyborg Olympics in Zurich, Switzerland. For discapacitated people with no legs, with no eyes, enhanced thanks to technology. This is coming in two years in Zurich. This is the beginning of these technologies used to enhance humans. All of this is called transhumanism, which is transcending human limitations thanks to science and technology. We humans, we are not the end of evolution. We are just the beginning of conscious evolution. Just like we are trans monkeys, there will be transhumans. But we have to do this carefully, because we don't want to finish like that. Our species is called Homo sapiens sapiens, which is quite unique. This means the human that knows, that knows. We are the first species that is fully aware of its existence, as far as we know. But we are not the end. We are just the beginning of this path. Life on this planet has existed for about three and a half billion years. But the first three billion years was only bacteria. And let me remind you, bacteria are immortal, or better, but bacteria do not age. Also, they have round chromosomes. They have no telomeres because they are completely round. So a bacteria does not age. It can die if you kill it, but it does not age. 
life appeared to be alive, not to die. And that is the beginning with bacteria. Anyway, humans, we are very new. Humans, in our current shape, we have existed for maybe 100,000 uh, years. But we are not the end of evolution. We are changing biologically, and now we are changing technologically. In the next few years, we are going to cure all diseases. There will be probably no paraplegics in 10 years. We will not have these horrible diseases. No more Parkinson's, no more Alzheimer's, no more aging. We are going to see the death of death in the next few years. But everything has yin and yang, as the Chinese say. And this is so complex that even the yin yang inside has little yin yang. And inside, more little, little, little yin yang. So there is always the dark side of the force. And I just went to North Korea last year. And uh, let me show you the two Koreas. There are a good country and a bad country. So we have to think about what is going to happen with humanity. Uh, the Chinese say it's better not to blame darkness, but to light up a candle. So I just want to light up a little candle, and that is why I went to North Korea, the last country in the world without internet. Well, South Korea is the most connected country in the planet, and they are the same, or they were the same country. So we just have to think about the world, which is one. We have to meditate about the world. I do a lot of meditation with the Hindus, with the Buddhists. And I finish with this Chinese word. I lived three years in Japan, so I learned some Chinese characters. Uh, at, at the beginning, I didn't know how to write it well, and I wrote it upside down or sideways. Now I know it is written like that. This is the word in Chinese and Japanese and Korean and sometimes in Vietnamese that means crisis. Crisis has two characters in Chinese. The first one means danger, but the second one means normally opportunity. So we are going through the biggest crisis in the history of humanity. But let's not only look at the danger, let's look at the opportunity. Thank you very much. A question about, um, it's sort of an ethical question. So you say there's going to be these technologies, uh, but technologies cost money. And I'm wondering, you know, do you see it as being available to everyone or only the rich people will uh, become immortal and all these things and then uh, that's basically my question. Yeah, uh, the ethical issues are fundamental and um, I myself come from the developing world, okay? Um, but I believe that technology is actually what will help us to leapfrog from poverty. If you look at the example of mobile telephones, in Africa, and there were no phones uh, 20 years ago. Now every African, and I'm saying Africa because it's the poorest continent in the planet, has a, a mobile phone. Why? Because the first technologies, when they come, actually they are expensive, and they are for the rich people, and they do not work. <laughs> then they go into mass production, they become cheap, and they work. And this is when the poor people get them. Uh, in terms of uh, anti-aging technologies, uh, obviously the first uh, immortals, to put it this way, will be probably people like Bill Gates or someone like that. But in, in very short time, everybody will have access to those technologies. But I understand the ethical issues. In fact, at Singularity University, there is a special course called Policy, Law, and Ethics, because this is fundamental. And I can tell you, as coming from the developing world, I'm concerned about that. Yes. Only the wealthy will have access to these technologies at a point where they don't work. By the time they work well, like cell phones, we have today one to two billion of them. We'll have five or six billion within a few years, and they get better and better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Those are uh, smartphones because in terms of uh, uh, cheap uh, mobile phones, uh, almost everybody now could have one. As you know, we've seen accelerating change in most technologies in the world. Why do you think? that kind of change has not been seen in energy and the, the use of fossil fuel? You know, this is so beautiful. I, I actually want to give another talk on that because that's my area. I work on energy. And people do not see this coming. In the next 20 years, we are going to go through a solar tsunami. 
a solar tsunami. What is happening in solar energy is going to disrupt completely the fossil fuel industry. And they don't see it. I was talking to Vinod Kosla, uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Solar Microsystems, and he said the same happened 30 years ago when they did not see the mobile phones, especially people in the normal telephone companies. And now everybody has a mobile phone. What we are going to see in solar energy and renewables is incredible. And this year is very especially important because now we have reached what is called grid parity, when renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels. And the trend continues cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And now that the, there is mass production of uh, solar panels, and solar panels use many of the same technologies as chips, semiconductor chips made of silicon and many of the same uh, companies like Applied Materials. Applied Materials made chips for computers and chips for solar panels. Okay, we are going to see a radical change. And in fact, Ray says, and, and, and also I believe it strongly, in 20 years will be fully renewable, mostly solar. Larry Page and I did a study for the National Academy of Engineering a few years ago before he got this new job. Uh, and we noted a uh, exponential growth. The, the number of watts produced by solar has been doubling every two years for the last 30 years. It's now only five doublings in two years each from 100% of the world's energy, at which point we'll be using one part in 10,000 of the sunlight that gets on it. Uh, absolutely. Uh, this is so true. We receive 10,000 times more solar energy on the atmosphere of the planet that we consume. 10,000 times more. We just need 1% of 1%. And, and this is growing really uh, exponentially, as Ray said. And it's doubling every two years. So I, I do believe in 20 years, fossil fuels will be fossil. We're working on uh, uh, sequencing the human genome, understanding the human brain. How are we doing all the commensal organisms that, that make up the walking ecosystems that we actually are, since our human cells are outnumbered drastically by all, all of the, the microflora and fauna uh, in our bodies? Um, yes, uh, there are also many people working on that. Um, as you said, we have more foreign cells or non-human cells than human cells in our bodies. But um, I, I don't particularly think that that is a problem because in order to, to create artificial organs, we don't have to go through all the same messy procedures that created us or that made us. Um, like uh, if you want to do an artificial heart, you don't copy a natural heart completely. Uh, or if you create a plane, you don't copy a bird. So I think uh, many of the things we will do in the future will not be totally biological and will not necessarily follow biology. But anyway, that's not my area of expertise. Uh, when we see the uh, death of death, will we also see the death of birth? Good question. Uh, well, actually, it might happen because, in fact, the population of the planet is already stabilizing. Today, we are over 7 billion people. And in most developed countries, except for the USA and Canada and Australia, the developed countries have stabilized or going down. I lived three years in Japan. The population of Japan declined one million people in the three years I was in Japan. Uh, Russia is going through a collapse in population. China will see the most incredible uh, common suicide. Uh, China is going to lose 200 million people between 2000, uh, 2030 and 2050. In any event, we are reaching a stabi a stabilization of population. And what will happen in the future, I do not know. But we are beginning to colonize the universe as well. We need more people to go to Mars. We need volunteers. Do you want to go to Mars? Uh, even if it is one way, as uh, Elon Musk, Elon Musk said he wants to die on Mars, but not on landing. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of, kind of piggybacking off his question as well, but assuming that we see at least a slowdown in birth rates, how would that affect? I mean, you saw how small of a portion of the whole evolutionary process we are. Would we just be drawing the line there, and we'd have to manually tinker with ourselves from then on, or like, how do we continue to evolve as a species as well? Because I feel like we're not exactly perfect. Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe Ray would like to comment on that better than me, but I think we are going to see a Cambrian explosion of new life forms. Well, it was actually surprising uh, that scientists discovered that there has been biological evolution of humans in the last thousand years, but uh, nonetheless, it's insignificant compared to our technological evolution. And that is expanding exponentially, and we're going to 
we are enhancing ourselves already. A kid in Africa with a smartphone has access to more information than the President of the United States had 15 years ago. And we're getting closer and closer to these technologies. And that's the future evolution of humanity into a human technological uh, symbiosis. Oh, here, here. Is, uh, is there, and is the timing of these technologies being planned at all in the sense that if we're going to become immortal, then maybe we should have figured out all our resource problems before then, or we should have figured out a way off this planet before that point, otherwise we're going to choke ourselves on this planet? Um, actually, we think we have unlimited resources on this planet. You know how much are you worth on raw materials? You are not worth even $100. Uh, or me, don't take it personally. Uh, I mean, we are 70% water, and we are not Evian or Perrier <laughs> water. We are tap water. The other 30% that make, makes us are very simple elements, sodium, calcium, potassium. We are very cheap to make. We are so cheap to make that our parents made us in one night. So humans are very cheap to make. Now with nanotechnology, we will be able to structure matter the way we want it. So actually, I think we have enough resources on this planet. Uh, we don't have a, a resource scarcity problem. And again, you know, with nanotechnology, we'll radically change uh, many things. And the universe is full of mass anyway. I mean, we live in a tiny, tiny planet in a tiny solar system, in a tiny galaxy. I mean, the universe is so big, so huge, so full of resources, and we are not even $100. Um, so when you speak of you know, these accelerating technologies and nanotechnology, um, obviously there's incredible opportunity for transhumanistic uh, possibilities, you know, for things to go really well. Um, but you know, when you speak of, I guess, the developing emotions and robots and the sort of artificial intelligent systems, you know, I think if there's also a possibility for you know negative, you know almost volition of these of these systems. Are you worried about that? I guess in the future. Of course, I'm always worried about this. But also, I wanted to emphasize different cultures. That's why I said in Japan, the Japanese love robots. I mean, they want to have sex with robots. Uh, they w will probably do it even better sometimes, huh? <laughs> uh, or they will not get tired. Um, but I am concerned. Obviously, I am concerned. This is the Terminator scenario or the Skynet. Does anyone know Google is a Skynet? Uh, so this, this is a possibility. But I think evolution has been improving the human conditions throughout the ages. And we will continue. But it is true, technology can be used for good or bad things. Beginning with fire. Fire was one of the first invasions by humans half a million years ago. And fire, you can use it for cooking or getting warm or for burning your enemy. Or nuclear technology for electricity or for nuclear weapons. So technology has a dark side. But I think the positive side is much bigger. And uh, humanity, obviously, in general, is good. I believe most humans are good. Just wanted to thank you, Jose, for an inspiring uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you.